Hello and welcome. My name is Bob Scheibel. I am the chairperson of Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights. And Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights is a member organization of this fine organization, Portland Media Center. MVPR exists in order to educate uh, not only the people of Maine, but also the politicians of Maine and the media of Maine about the Palestinian struggle for their human dignity and their human and political rights. Our ultimate goal or mission is by all peaceful means possible to achieve total equality, freedom, and justice for all peoples living between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Now, we have a special guest today from Belarus, and you may well be wondering why is MVPR inviting somebody to speak from Belarus? That's quite a ways away from Palestine. Well, here's why. Justice organizations and communities around the world have in recent years been increasingly speaking out and reaching out to each other to show their solidarity and their support because they realize that injustice in one place increases and encourages injustice in another place. Conversely, when injustice is overcome in one place, that encourages the people seeking justice in other places. So in this country, for example, Palestinian rights groups such as Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, Eyewitness Palestine, um, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights have all had made a presence at places like Standing Rock to support Native American rights there, and also uh, after police violence against blacks in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, they were there to show support for African Americans. And Eyewitness Palestine has taken several groups, delegations of African Americans, including one or two from Ferguson itself, to Palestine in order to educate these African Americans about Palestinian struggle and um, to show, and the black people have wanted to go there to show their solidarity. So, today, the people of Belarus are struggling for some rights of their own. And that is why we happen to have invited our guest, because Maine Voices wants to show its solidarity with the people of Belarus. So let me introduce our guest. Our guest is Igor Lepayev. Igor uh, was born and reared in Belarus. He moved with his young family uh, to the city of Atlanta about 22 years ago, where he works as a software engineer. Mm -hmm. I came to know Igor through my wonderful neighbors, um, Alexander, or Alex, uh, Sasha Lepayev, who um, also, of course, comes from Belarus, and his wife, Lisa, who's from Ukraine. But they live next door, and I got to know something about, what, I began paying more attention to Belarus and talking with my neighbors and learning about what, um, what was happening there. So um, we began talking about how we could, how we could help our uh, people here in Maine know more about Belarus. And they informed me, wow, Igor is coming up to visit from Atlanta. And he's uh, very well aware of everything that's going on there now. And he speaks uh, very good English. And so he would be a good one to uh, be interviewed at Portland Media Center. So I want to say welcome. Welcome, Igor, to um, Maine. Welcome to Portland and welcome to Portland Media Center. Um, let's start out by having you tell us exactly where on the globe 
is Belarus located? Because a lot of our people may not know. Okay, thank you, Bob. Yeah. Uh, Belarus is located in Eastern Europe. Uh, it used to be part of the Soviet Union and became an independent state when Soviet Union broke up, up back in 1991. Mm. So since then it's an independent country. And geographically it's located between Russia and Poland. So, and now the border with Poland is also the border with European Union, the mm -hmm. EU. Right. And we also border Latvia and Lithuania to the like north. And they are also part of the They're EU They're also part now. of the EU. And in the south, we border Ukraine. Okay. So we are in that region that uh, had been changing drastically since the fall of communism, mm -hmm. in both in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, but again, unfortunately, we are behind the actual democratic changes, and this is something that we want to talk about. Okay, yeah. So that gets us to this. Then tell us why um, there are street protests, and we'll come back a little bit later to the size of them and all of that. But mm -hmm. help us understand why are people protesting in the streets? in Belarus at this time? Uh, let's start with uh, the current situation with power. Right? Yes, okay. Uh, president of Belarus, Lukashenko, is the first and the only president of independent Belarus. Since, Since its formation in 1991. Since 1994. 1994. It took about two and a half years between the independents and people were working on a new constitution yeah. of newly formed independent Belarus yeah. and it had this position of president, the first one in history. So that would be as if George Washington, when he became our first president, then remained we'll, we'll, our president we'll, we'll still for be. 22 years. <laughs> or until now. <laughs> or until now, yes. Okay. Exactly. He yes. Did, he's our first and our only. That's yeah, what okay. happened. and. Uh, he managed to stay in power for so long because he basically was rigging the elections and falsifying the results. But he didn't get any major opposition until mm -hmm. now. And uh, this whole unrest, this whole protests, they started since uh, the 9th of August, okay. just over two weeks ago, right. when the formal presidential election took place. Yes. And the vast majority of Belarusian people, I will put the number as high as maybe 80%, uh, were cheated. Their votes were not counted. Lukashenko announced his own victory with 80%, which is the yeah. opposite to the reality. And people, this time, they kind of, they just got very angry. Said enough. You know? Yeah, they said enough is enough. And the only way in the authoritarian regime to make your voices heard is just to get out in the streets. Well, this now, the what, um, in this country, it seems like every couple of weeks we have polls coming out telling us who's leading, who's behind. Were there <laughs> polls like that prior to this election? No. Uh, there is only one official polling agency, oh. which is full of lies. Okay. And but people were running internet polls, oh. kind of independent yeah. internet polls. Of course, they cannot be even scientifically, you know, uh, right. correct or something right. because not everybody has internet. But according to those polls, and there were several of those, uh, Lukashenko had as little as three percent wow. of support, wow. not even thirty or forty, three percent. That's why, yeah, he got a nickname, Sasha three percent. <laughs> <laughs> I and love that. Once you, Sasha 3%. Yeah, Sasha 3%. Once you travel across Belarus and, you know, look around, you will see a lot of this 3%. <laughs> Just, you know, graffitis, <laughs> writings anywhere. So and that might take, like in this country, the 1% has become <laughs> a big term. So now in, in Belarus, yeah. it's the 3%. It's the Sasha 3%. 3%. 3%. Okay. So hmm. this is... How much? So I would put personally, of course I'm not a scientist, but personally I won't, won't put his support, uh, maybe 20%, that's the top. Mm. Probably even less. Mm -hmm. Something between 10 and 15%. Mm -hmm. This is his actual support, which includes just, you know, people from government, oh, yes. from both local, you know, national, right. and the like police and, and the army. 
mm -hmm. who are kind of forced to yeah. recognize him as president. Yeah, yeah. Now, is there any evidence that the voting was fraudulent and there was cheating uh, going it's, on? And it's overwhelming. Yeah, like so, what? So, uh, monitors who are supposed to monitor, you know, the polls, yeah. to, they were not allowed to see what's happening. In oh. many cases, they were asked just to leave the station, just be outside. So the only thing they could do is just count people who walk in to vote, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, there are even there were pictures uh, in the web. Somebody found half burned true ballots with the check boxes for Lukashenko opponents. Oh. So they just burned them. They just threw them away. Oh. Um, the uh, number of people who came to vote at the stations, even those monitors, they could count them, yeah. right? The official numbers were often as twice as big as the actual number of people who showed up. Oh. Actually, so if, they, if the people outside monitored, okay, 600 people came into this station today, when those votes were then sent to the central area, they, they recorded maybe 1,200. Correct, oh. correct. So those were the cases. Okay. In, in many stations, the number of people who voted yeah. was more than 100%. So they rigged oh. it so much oh. that the actual number who voted was more than the people registered. So some of those people the clearly <laughs> voted twice. Everybody came and voted and some voted more than once. Right. Yeah. And even at the very highest level, even those numbers yeah. were rigged at the very top, which is the Central uh, Election Commission. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. Uh, the head of the Central Election uh, Commission is Lukashenko, personal appointee. Oh. So the whole election process is ruled by Lukashenko appointee, the person he appointed, uh, and it was actually illegal. He couldn't you, do that. Do you know that there was uh, <laughs> something roughly comparable to that in the state of Georgia, not Georgia over there, but Georgia in the south of yes. this country, okay. when there was a race for the governor and I think the uh, state attorney general, who's supposed to oversee the elections, was actually running for governor. And he should have stepped down mm -hmm. and turned that overseeing the elections to somebody else, but he did not. And so that yeah, was... Yeah, something like that happened. I'm, I'm from the state of Georgia. Yeah, that's you right. Know. I was yeah, I remember. That it, it, it was yeah. something like that. I'm, I don't know the details. So it's sort of like the, uh, the fox watching the chicken coop, <laughs> so to speak. Well, now let me ask you this question. Um, who, who were the people running against Lukashenko? And it's a very unique story, actually, very interesting. So there were a couple of candidates. Uh, in, according to Belarusian law, any person, I think of the appropriate age, uh, can choose to run for president. And in order to be officially registered as a candidate, that person should collect uh, at least 100,000 signatures from anybody, just in the streets. So there were like small, you know, PK polling stations in the streets, just gathering signatures. Right. And Lukashenko, of course, was monitoring that process really, really closely. So yes. as soon as he saw a candidate getting more than 100,000 signatures, yeah. uh, two of those candidates were thrown to jail. So uh, for, for something they never did. Yes. And uh, two of them are still in jail until this day. One candidate, oh, okay, Th those signatures, then they, they are sent to the Central Electoral Commission, have to be verified. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one candidate, out of 400,000 signatures, they said that valid are only 170. So they threw away more than 200 thousand signatures. But that candidate was still valid, but he was in jail. But he was in, okay. That candidate was in jail. Another candidate who was not in jail, he got at about 200,000, but they only said the valid is only 70 K, oh, less 70. than 100,000 threshold. Yes. Okay. So he was moved away from the competition. But here's the most interesting story. I don't think it happened anywhere else in the world. One very popular person, uh, Sergei Tikhanovsky, he was a very popular blogger. He started uh, running you know, his blogs, traveling across Belarus, uh, interviewing people, just as we call like simple people, like mm -hmm. all across the country. 
Who were telling stories about how poor they are, that they have like no no future, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And he was it was all you know filmed and uh, mm. all over the internet. Not the kind of thing that an autocrat likes to have. That's exactly, known. exactly true. So when Sergei Tikhon, and he has like a very strong personality, he like a national born leader. He wanted also to be a candidate, oh. but he was temporarily jailed like uh, administrative arrest. Mm -hmm. And even that formally was used as a reason not to let him to be officially oh, registered. Oh, because he had been arrested. Because he was staying in jail at that time. So okay. when his wife, Svetlana, uh, she had all the papers, all the necessary papers for her husband. She came in to register him and was denied. Then she kind of, something happened to her as she described it later. Then she said, then register me. And everybody was, didn't, didn't know what to answer, and they had to. So she was registered <laughs> oh. as a candidate. She had absolutely no political experience. She's basically a housewife. Yes. So she's just raising her two, two of her children. But she, she was officially registered as a candidate, and she became immensely popular in mm. Belarus. People were standing for hours, literally miles, in lines to put the signature for to her. To give her the 100,000. Right. Right. Okay. And she actually managed to get enough signatures, and she was registered the candidate. Ah. This is how it happened. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Okay. And so now she is the person then that f many people think actually won the election. Correct. And she, did I hear correctly, she had to flee to Lithuania? Right. She was forced to initially. Uh, she started to get phone calls threatening her kids. So initially she had her kids move to Lithuania. And then when she came, after the election day, she came to the Central uh, Election Commission to uh, basically to open a case against fraud because mm -hmm. for her it was obvious that her, you know, votes for her were simply stolen. She was put very horrible pressure on by KGB. In Belarus, they still have KGB, the oh. Soviet-style KGB with the same abbreviation. Okay. Uh, they were put enormous pressure on her, but they let her also to flee to Lithuania. Mm. So currently she is in Lithuania, but she is considered by many, by the vast majority, to be a president-elect. And since that time, hasn't she declared mm herself to be a kind of uh, caretaker leader in absentia yes. or something like that until, yes. uh, until new elections can be. Yes, and actually her, her all kind of program that she uh, announced before the election was, she openly said, I'm not a politician, I, I don't want to be president. I'm not that kind of person, right? Yeah. What I want to do, I want to be elected president and make everything that way that we can run free and fair elections in six months from now. Okay. So that all political prisoners be freed, everybody who was forced to exile can come back to Belarus, right. and we can have free elections with our actual leaders. And this is what the vast majority of Belarusians voted for, mm. to have that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she would want to be a transition. Right. A transition. She's like a symbol. She's, uh, uh, I think, 37 years old, so a young, beautiful lady. Yeah. And she's a lady which is not very common in that part of the world for women to be in like high political positions. Yeah. Yeah. So all Belarus fell in love with her. So everybody <laughs> wanted to, her to be our yeah. new president. I personally would, would love her to be our new president. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so she's still out of the country right now. Correct. And she confirmed she would not return while Lukashenko is in power, because she simply oh, yeah. fears for her life, oh, I'm which sure. is absolutely serious, and we will talk about that. A now, bit. how did yes? How did uh, Lukashenko? He was initially, I take it, freely elected. That's right. Then how did he wind up taking or getting so much power? What did he do to get it? Um, he changed the constitution. That he was changed it. yeah. He changed the constitution, which was only like three years old because yeah. it was new constitution for the newly independent state. So he was uh, elected in the free and fair elections mm -hmm. back in 1994. 
a year after the elections, in 1995, he returned the old Soviet Belarusian symbols, old Belarusian flag oh. and the coat of arms. So that was his first huge step. So he brought back so. the flag for right. the republic or the, the, the Soviet, state of the Soviet slightly Union. Slightly modified, just slightly modified, because he couldn't be exactly as yeah, it was, yeah. because but it slightly, was like okay. slightly modified with the same color, same layout. And what he did, he ran what's called a referendum, which was totally rigged. So formally, people voted for that. Uh -huh. which in reality was not. Yeah. And a year later, in 1996, he staged what's considered just a coup. So he changed the constitution, he again held the referendum. Uh, our initial constitution, Belarusian constitution, was pretty fair. There was also this division of powers, mm -hmm. you know, so right. the president was an executive branch. But in 1996, Lukashenko assigned himself the legislative power also. Oh. He writes laws in Belarus. Okay. So, and that was uh, as the result of this 1996 referendum, which was also totally rigged. Hmm. But since then, he is the only, uh, all power is in him. All other institutions were destroyed. Wow. Uh, the parliament is like puppet parliament. They make no decisions yeah. at all in real life. The yeah. same with the Supreme Court. Supreme Court only supports what Lukashenko says. So whatever he does, he's the only source of power. Hmm. Now that, so he's been in power for 20 something years. Correct. What has happened in the last year or so, or two or three years to make people decide, I assume earlier elections were also rigged, why have people come out in such numbers this time to protest? Uh, Lukashenko has been gradually losing his support. Mm. So even 10 years ago, when there were very similar situation, the, we had elections in December 2010, mm. they were mm. also very similarly uh, rigged. All independent candidates, nearly all independent candidates for presidents were jailed then 10 years ago. Kind of a pattern in yeah, Belarus, right? Run for office and you get jailed. There were also protests, but they were on much smaller scale. And the reason is, Bob, that Lukashenko still enjoyed pretty wide support mm -hmm. then, 10 years ago. 10 years. So, and for a dictator uh, to stay in power, it's probably enough to have 30-40% of support, mm -hmm. close to 50%, to close to a half. Mm -hmm. So he stayed in power. Many people were kind of indifferent. They were okay with Lukashenko in power because the standard of living was not bad. Mm -hmm. you know, they had personal freedoms. They could travel. You know, mm -hmm. they, they all got jobs. But in the decade since those elections, many things changed. So economic situation worsened considerably. Many people today in Belarus have to work in neighboring countries because mm. there are no jobs for them in Belarus. Mm. So they, they don't move permanently, but they have some sort of working permits. So they right. work in Russia and in uh, Poland. And there are millions that have to work like that. People barely mm. see the families, right? They so only they want home. an opportunity. I know in, in this country, um, I forget who it was, it might have been James Carvel who said to Clinton one time, it's the economy, stupid, yes, it's the economy. Yes, I, I know so case. that seems to be true everywhere. So if the economy was looking weaker and people were suffering more economically, they would begin to be not quite so pleased with their autocratic ruler. You're exactly right. So that was so happening more. That was, that's a major factor, yes. right? Uh, the economical factor. And what about oh, COVID? Yeah, he made a couple of other mistakes. So with COVID, he pretended COVID doesn't exist. Oh, so, sounds like America in the month of February, March. <laughs> <laughs> but it happened throughout. So there was absolutely no quarantine, no restrictions, no nothing. And is it so, he the one that said, uh, um, just drink more vodka? That's what that's you... Exactly, this is true. Yeah, I hate to keep making these kind of crude analogies, but we had a president... We have a president who once suggested, 
drinking uh, or somehow ingesting um, Lysol or some other kind of thing like that. So these autocrats sometimes have interesting uh, approaches to disease. But this was Lukashenko saying, yeah. He said, drink, drink vodka, go to the sauna, yeah. and ride a tractor. And ride, ride the tractor. A tractor. Yeah, well, we because haven't heard that one here he, yet. He has a, a background from a collective farm, which okay. is a Soviet style yeah. of you yes. know, agriculture yeah. unit. And he, the only thing he's good at is that. It's to be, you know, to, sh to tell people how to, you know, dig potatoes. And he often does. Oh, he does. teaches people how to dig potatoes. Okay. Because this is the only thing he's probably good at. Okay. So, yeah, COVID was another factor when people felt, you know, lied to and put their lives in danger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they felt that the government doesn't <clears throat> care about people anymore. Mm -hmm. So another factor was he had to raise the retirement age oh. considerably. W the first time it happened last in the Soviet Union under Nikita Khrushchev back in 1950s. So it was like first time in 60 years oh, wow. that the retirement age, you know, uh, he added a few years to that. Um, so all these factors, and also he is a very, uh, from my point, he is very weird personality. He's very rude. He calls his own Belarusian people bad names. Huh. Yeah, so when he addresses people who protest, he calls them bad names like uh, rats and something like that. You mean people yeah. who protest him? He yeah. calls them rats. He calls them rats, yeah, yeah, and other bad words. Another main factor is since 2010 elections, uh, a younger generation grew up. Mm. So today we have younger generation people who are no different from American young people or European young people. Mm -hmm. And they know what's going on around the world. And our close neighbors, especially Poland and Lithuania, they, they had to go through the same process. Lithuania was a former Soviet Republic, same way as Belarus mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. When the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc you know, fell back in the late 80s, early 90s, economic situation in Belarus was better than that of Poland. Mm. Polish people would come to Belarus to buy things, to do mm. shopping, because right. their economy was ruined there. Right. In just probably a decade, and now it's a huge contrast the other way around. People go to Poland mm. for shopping because mm. everything is cheaper there, the goods are better, the quality is better. And Poland is a free country. You can go there, mm. you know, enjoy all your freedoms. They have elections, you know, they elect their mm -hmm. uh, officials, nothing like that in Belarus. So this, all those factors added to people uh, and also, there's this simple psychological um, feeling, just getting tired of one and the same face to represent mm -hmm. your country. You know, mm -hmm. We want somebody else. Mm -hmm. We're tired of this guy. He's, now, he's not as uh, charismatic and energized as he was 26 years ago when he was young. Oh, yeah. He was about 40 years old. Now, now mm -hmm. he's like you know, getting older and uh, he's not like that anymore. And younger generation simply doesn't like this person mm. to be the president. Okay. Now what about, um, where have people at all been upset about, I think you told me they, he came in and he brought the new flag. And at one point oh, he yes. brought the old flag from the Soviet Union for Belarus. Correct. And the flag mm -hmm. that people like are the red, stripe with two stripes, white stripes on the outside. White, red, were, white. Were people yeah. upset about not having their own flag? Uh, initially, there was a relatively small, you know, part of uh, Belarusian population who were fighting for the old national flag. Yeah. With white, red, and white stripes. And I think we've got that behind us yeah, here. Yeah, those yeah. are the colors. Yeah. That's exactly right. Now, I can't remember if I said this earlier or not, but your brother also has that flag flying on his back porch. Yes. And we have our, we have the Palestinian flag on our back porch. Yes, and uh, this national flag, although not formally banned, but de facto was kind of was banned. People could be arrested for just mm. waving this flag. Is in that the right? Of Belarus. Well, you know, f another interjection here, but um, autocratic kind of, well, Israel doesn't have a dictator. Well, some people might think Netanyahu has become that. But the state of Israel has sort of operated as a dictator to the people of Palestine. 
and in Palestine on the West Bank, you can be arrested for holding up a Palestinian flag. So okay. another kind of There's another, sense of... Yeah, uh, another link here. Yeah. And um, so, but more and more people gradually in time started to realize that this has to be our, you know, state, our national flag. Because on the one hand, it, 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 it's historic. It has, you know, centuries of yeah. history. It comes from Middle Ages. And uh, actually it's, it symbolizes like a white cloth taken to carry, you know, the injured mm. from the battlefields. Okay. And that's what left the stripe of red blood. Oh, is that right? Yeah, th this is oh. the, the origin. Oh, that's and pretty actually, powerful image. Bob, today it's again, it again becomes the truth because yes. we will talk about it. Well, that. I wanted to talk about a shift of that now. What has, yeah. what has Lukashenko's response been to all of these? How, how big have the demonstrations been now compared to 10 years ago? And what has he done in response? So demonstrations were much bigger th this time. And it, it, it started uh, weeks ago, even before the elections. Uh, people were kind of showing the support uh, towards Lukashenko opponents. Mm. And it was all across Belarus for the first time. I think for the first time in the history of the country, it was not only Minsk, which is the capital and kind of sort of politicized, but the protests were happening all around the country, even in small villages. Hmm. Just the, in the village, there were 100 people there, right? Really? Two or three people will come out with the white, red, white flag. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but in, in other major cities in Belarus, there were thousands and tens of thousands. So people came out after the elections, uh, ten, close to 100,000, I, yeah, I would I think say. I the number was 100,000 or, yeah, there I've are lots of some pictures. pictures of just squares and streets just thronged yeah. with people. L Lukashenko's response was horrifying, 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 horrifying. He ordered the riot police to not just to detain and arrest people, but to savagely beat and torture them. Mm. People were beaten, captured, brought to jail, and tortured there for days. And and we've got pictures, right? Yeah. There, are pictures there are pictures to verify this. There are people, pictures. The bruises on their yeah, bodies. Yeah, the real bruises and uh, you know suffering. The stories of the people who were detained. The total number of the detained people is close to seven thousand. Wow. So nearly everyone in Belarus today has either has a person they know, like a member of the families or a friend right. who was detained, or they know something who had those relatives. I personally, I still keep in touch with uh, my schoolmates. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, we have like a group uh, that we chat about. Uh, one of my schoolmate friend's son was arrested and detained. And for two days, she had no knowledge whether he's alive or what happens. For two days, wow. she didn't know. Can you imagine today, oh, yeah. not knowing for two days whether your son is alive yeah. and well, or whether he yeah. has been tortured to death. So, oh, yeah. oh, that's awful. Well, let me insert another parallel here. When, when my wife and I made our first trip to Palestine in 2010, everybody you meet in the West Bank has a family member who has been imprisoned. And most of them have a family member or a friend who has been killed. They say martyred. So it's a very common, and it's also commonplace because lots of young people go out and they throw their stones at tanks and all because of the, of the occupation. They get arrested in the middle of the night and are oftentimes young children, as, as, as young as age 12, are taken to prisons and their parents may not know for days or weeks where they are. So there's a, it's an awful feeling. We've met some of those people who have talked about, I didn't know where my son was. I didn't know where my daughter was, you know, for that but amount of time. The, now, I think there were also some stories even of rape. Yes, in the, there are in stories the, of rape, even rape of men, of grown up men. Really? Yeah, the horrible stories. Um, people uh, uh, suffered immensely, but let me, um, point this out, Bob. All those uh, protests and demonstrations were completely peaceful. Mm. Not even compared to what's going on around here in the U.S., yeah, right? Yeah. Not even close. There are videos and pictures of people protesting absolutely peacefully. Not single damage, not s s single car overturned, or not mm -hmm. a single glass, bro no nothing, mm -hmm. nothing of like that. And there are striking images of people 
uh, collecting trash after themselves. Oh, after the demonstration. Uh, after the demonstration. So they say that the squares that we came in to, to protest were cleaner when we left. In Compared America, people were. don't do that even after visiting uh, this, this is national monument sites. <laughs> this is striking. Trash. There are a couple of other pictures that, you know, one of the big crowds, people would stand on benches just to see better. They will, they will take their shoes off to stand on benches. Oh, really? Yeah, there are people, uh, volunteers, giving people like water and snacks. Yeah. So there are also very good images. Uh, the, the authorities in Minsk, they shut down the power so the traffic lights wouldn't work. The people, volunteers, would, you know, uh, uh, just direct the traffic. Mm -hmm. And the protesters, who were in thousands of, uh, sorry, hundreds of thousands, uh, by some estimate there were as many as 500,000 people, they would stop on traffic lights to, on, to let, you know, the, yes. the cars move on. This is, this is I, I want to make that, you know, very so special. So very, very peaceful. Very Even, peaceful. Uh, Weren't there even some people who were just bystanders or bysitters? That was also unfortunately common in their videos of that too. Like people, the, uh, the cyclists, you know, people who ride bikes, they yeah. were just, you know, having a stop, maybe having a rest, having, drinking some water, just chatting. And then this uh, van with the riot police stops by, about five or six or seven riot policemen in full gear with the batons, they come out, start beating those people and throw and arresting them. And those, those Horrible pictures happen all over Belarus. So a very, very peaceful nation. Belarusians suffered a lot in their history. Uh, every major uh, collision or war would bring a lot of harm, like the Second World War, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there are numbers that either uh, each third, or each fourth Belarusian was, you know, perished, uh, perished, mm. or lost their lives during the wars. And it happened throughout the centuries because Belarus physic uh, geographically is located between superpower of Russia yeah. and also superpower of Germany. Yes. Uh, and okay. there were all, always these military conflicts and stuff like that. So Belarusian kind of genetically, they're very, very peaceful. They don't want any wars and anything. Mm -hmm. And the current protest is not uh, to bring chaos or is not to, to do something right. like that. The only thing people want, let their voices heard. You know, let let us have the uh, elections. That that's what people want. And I think that um, Lukashenko, in beating people so having them beaten so brutally, he was hoping that that would scare other people away, but then and and make them go back home and stop. But I am I correct that when the people were released from prison and they told their stories and people saw what happened to them. That made people even more determined, did it not? Yeah, that's exactly right, Bob. That's exactly what happened. More people are now coming out to the streets because they were outraged and horrified with what happened to their kids mostly because the vast majority of yeah. those arrested and beaten were young people. Yeah. Young, peaceful people yeah. were who, you know, who mentally uh, Europeans, yeah. uh, 21st century, and then they are raped and, you know, some of them, officially, six people have died during mm, the process right? and about a hundred are not yet accounted for. Mm. So there are rumors that uh, they just didn't, you know, survive the torture mm. and, and mm -hmm. died. Okay. So those, and this is happening just next door to the European Union, just right there, not in some remote region. Yes. It's right there in the center of Europe, European yes. nation with little centuries of history is just being brutally destroyed. Now, what has Russia's response been? What has Mr. Putin's uh, response Putin been? Putin is sitting and waiting. Lukashenko actually called Putin, well, several times. I don't know the actual number of calls he made. And all of them were asking to intervene militarily. Oh. To, uh, to do something Putin did to Ukraine six but years ago. But has Putin criticized uh, Lukashenko? No, for Putin doing it? actually was one of the first world leaders to congratulate him with his with winning victory. the elections. Oh. There were a handful of others. Putin was probably the first or one of the first. What about the European Union? What about the, the uh, Union? European Union has some words not uh, as strong as I personally and think the majority of Belarusians want. But at the very least, they announced Lukashenko persona non grata, meaning he cannot even show up on, in any European country. Mm -hmm. And they're working on personal sanctions against 
Lukashenko himself and everybody else was responsible for rigging the election and then for the brutal you and know, would they um, uh, was making him persona non grata <clears throat> have they gone as far as to say that if he does travel in Europe that he can be arrested for war crimes or crimes I, I against humanity? I don't think they said exactly this. But no. that is a possibility. They could come to that. They you could. Know? They could. Uh, the Belarusian people want more support. They want both the EU and the United States to declare Lukashenko completely illegitimate. Okay, he well, has I was gonna... no legitimacy. Okay, I wanted to come to that. Okay. What would you like for the U.S. government to do? What would you like for Mr. Uh, for President? Um, um, why am I blanking on his name? <laughs> President <laughs> for, Trump. President Trump. <laughs> what would you like for President yeah, Trump to I, do? I would like uh, for for the Americans and President Trump to put a lot more pressure on Lukashenko and his cronies to isolate him, to deprive him of funding. So he's running out of money, so he cannot pay to, to these, you know, uh, crooks and uh, mm -hmm. riot police who are so cruel. And uh, formally announce him as an illegitimate person. He's not representing Belarus anymore. He lost in a landslide. And then what he did to the Belarusian people, he became like a, a criminal. He... So uh, he cannot be recognized as a representative of Belarusian people anymore. So, and again, the United States always stood by, you know, nations who are fighting for freedom. Mm -hmm. Now Belarusian people are fighting for, for their freedom and they've been brutally beaten and, you know, imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And uh, people of Belarus and myself, we want American, you know, government to to be more strict on that and to say that openly. And I don't think there was any official statement yet. No. I think I read where um, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, issued a statement, um, a written statement, condemning the elections as fraudulent. But um, the true test in this country of whether or not our leadership is really feeling strongly about something is the presidential tweet. I think it's the first, this is the first time in America that government policy has been indicated more by a tweet than by, say, a presidential address in the Rose Garden or in the Oval Office. But I don't think there's been any presidential tweet yet condemning what's going on in, in, uh, in Belarus. Nothing I heard of. No. So I would agree we, with you. We will that. get, um, we'll certainly get plenty of tweets and other things about um, um, criminal protesters in this country or criminal rapist people coming up from Mexico, but so far we've had no tweet about the criminal behavior of Mr. Lukashenko. This is right. That's right. I haven't heard anything of that kind. And let, uh, let me tell you, Bob, that those arrests, they still continue to this day. People still get there, especially people who, became, who become sort of leaders. Like uh, many uh, manufacturing plants and factories, they went on strike. And partially, not to the extent that it matters, but they're kind of, the number of those gradually growing. So when there's any leader that emerges, immediately goes, you know, to jail today. So those arrests... Is that right? Yes. Those arrests, they still continue. They haven't stopped. So they've, they've curtailed some of the out-in-the-street brutality, but right. they're still arresting Correct. people more, right. more uh, secretly or more privately, uh, right. yes. arresting them. That's true, yes. And, or uh, how are the strikes? Or did the... Um, or the big manufacturing plants, which are state-owned, are they, um, are those men and women working there, men mainly, I guess, are they striking? Uh, partially, as I said, not to the extent that they, I think they should. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, there's a major um, truck manufacturing plant, and I think it has like 20,000 employees but only a few hundred go mm. on strike. 
so insignificant number. And are these people, you think, genuinely in support of him, or is it a matter of being afraid to go out on the limb? Uh, well, they're under enormous pressure. Yes. People, people who don't go on strike, they're personally told, if you go, you'll, use, you'll lose your job. And that's probably so the, that's, least, the it, least bad thing that will happen. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of, in Belarus, it's, it's a hard choice because having a job in Belarus is scarce. If you lose your job, you may have to go and work in Russia, as mm. we talked about. Yeah. So, and historically, what makes it even more difficult, people of Belarus are so kind of disciplined. For them, going to work is the natural way of living their lives. Yes. Not going to work, this is something that they are not used to. I see. So I, see. I, I, I know that that will be a very effective tool in putting much pressure on Lukashenko, just, you know, strikes. But this is not at that scale yet. Although many, many uh, enterprises take part in that, yeah. at least partially. Right. But as of now, it's not on that scale yet. The protests, though, let me say that, each Sunday, they gather enormous number of people. Both Sundays that we had since the election, yeah. we had only two Sundays. Uh, there were totally across Belarus, there were between four and five hundred thousand people. Wow. So half a million. Wow. Which is a lot for a country yeah. of maybe nine yeah. million. Yeah. The total population is nine million. So here in the United States and more specifically in Maine, um, I will now sort of talk to our audience and say, if you have been listening to this interview and you would like to help the people of Belarus, then I urge you to place a telephone call to um, our two senators, Senator King, Senator Collins, um, and also to our representatives in the first district, Representative uh, Congresswoman Shelley Pengree, and in the second district to Jared Goldman. Please, uh, Golden, Jared Golden. Please um, contact these people, uh, urge them to urge our government, our leadership, Mr. Pompeo, our president, Mr. Trump, to speak out, to isolate diplomatically Mr. Uh, Lukashenko, and if we have means at our disposal economically, like putting economic sanctions on Belarus, urge our Congress people to urge our government, our federal government, to do that. These are ways that you could help the people of Belarus to get the same kind of right that you're going to have in just a few days, a few weeks, to elect your leadership. Well, thank you, Igor, for thank being you. here today and bringing us up to speed and educating us on the wonderful little nation of Belarus that I've sort of come to love in the last <laughs> week or two from talking with my neighbors and looking at the pictures of the wonderful Belarusian people. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you for having me and having this opportunity to address your audience. It's really thank a pleasure. you very much. So Bob Scheibel from Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights saying have a good evening or day. Bye-bye.